What's up, everybody? It's Jason Cruz here once again with another episode of The Legal Submission. And this time, we are going to be talking about the UFC antitrust lawsuit and blame somebody. Basically, the kids have an expression called selling. You sold the game, meaning you blew the game, or uh, something, of, something of that nature. My son uses it all the time. But we are going to discuss who sold the UFC antitrust settlement. Now, we uh, have several people we could, we could talk about as to why the $335 million lawsuit was denied by Judge Boulware and why now both parties, the Zufa and the plaintiffs, will prepare to get to going to trial. Now, let's put this out there first and foremost. The lawsuit, Lee versus Zufa, is the case that is going to trial in October, um, attentively anyway, October 28th. Johnson versus Zufa will be going to will be going to uh, discovery. I mean, we'll be having discovery, so we'll have, be having fact and expert discovery, which will be also something that the parties will be talking about at the August 19th status conference, which will determine how we proceed going forward. So there is there's, there is a possibility that this still may not go to trial because the, case, the parties will have settled. Now, uh, there are a lot of factors that we'll have to go through if the parties do settle and Judge Boulware agrees to it. First and foremost, uh, Zufa will have to go come up with more money. Uh, it, it was clear that Judge Boulware was concerned with the Johnson plaintiffs as far as the contracts that they signed uh, regarding arbitration clauses and non-arbitration clauses and the shifting of money that went to the Lee, Lee plaintiffs in the amended allocation of set, uh, uh, the amended settlement plan, uh, which saw more of the Lee uh, plaintiffs getting money, whereas the the Johnson plaintiffs uh, received a little less. Now, w let's get back to uh, who, who, who to blame here. Who sold this particular uh, settlement plan? Now, I listed on my uh, social media uh, a, a list of four people for in the entities that it could be. Now, uh, I will... Uh, I myself uh, differ from what the what the social media uh, <coughs> poll did. It was an informal poll, of course. Who knows who was voting? And not a lot of people vote on my polls. But let's talk about whose fault is it least. Who do I think uh, is not uh, worthy of blame for this settlement? And I, first, I think that Zufa alone is not uh, not guilty of any uh, any issue regarding the settlement. Now, of course, they there is anti-competitive uh, behavior alleged that Zufa uh, uh, Zufa has claimed to have uh, have done, which had suppressed fighter wages, and therefore that is why. Uh, uh, several, well, uh, uh, um, approximately 36 fighters in the Lee uh, settlement, the proposed settlement that was turned down, were going to receive um, at least a million dollars. And that's uh, the frustration part of this is that the, these, there is fighters that were going to receive their, um, at least a million dollars, but they will not now at, at, at this particular point. Zufa was willing to pay $335 million as well as make some concessions with the contracts as they were going to go forward. However, it's not Zufa's uh, particular issue as far as uh, you know, the, the money amount that they offered the plaintiffs. Realistically, the, uh, the, the plaintiffs could have just denied the dollar amount and proceeded to trial or continued on with more settlement negotiations or something of that fact. So you know, it was purely up to Zufa to, to come up with a number and within, their, within what they wanted to provide or settle out 
these two cases. And I don't have it as fact, but I'm fairly certain that Zufer wanted to get rid of both of the cases, not one. That position may change as, after this August 19th uh, status conference if we are have a dead set trial date in Lee. You might see Zufa come to the table more to get rid of Lee and then address Johnson at a, at a further point. But prior to uh, Judge Bulware's uh, denial of the 335 settlement, it, 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 uh, it was Zufa's plan to get rid of both lawsuits. Now, there is also the issue regarding addressing the con contractual terms which Zufa made, I would say, tangible and real uh, changes to their contract, but practically they were cosmetic in nature because the, the contractual provisions would only stay in place for five years, as well as the fact that if there was an impairment or impact to the business of the UFC, they could go back to a mediator or arbitrator and, uh, and amend that uh, the contractual provision. So there, there is still that, that particular fact. So at this point, I would say Zufa is in the catbird seat as far as how they look in negotiating uh, a settlement. It's clear that the plaintiffs don't want to go. Zufa doesn't want to go. But the, the fact of the matter is Zufa still has some leverage here because uh, based coming out of the settlement ne negotiations, it was clear that plaintiffs were going to take less than what Judge Bulware believes was valid. So there you go. Not Zufa's fault. Now let's talk about Judge Bulware. Certainly, it is up to the trial court judge to determine whether the class of individuals that the plaintiffs had uh, brought forth should be certified. And he did so. He certified the class. He believed that the uh, there was a good case to be made, not proven yet, but to be made, that there was anti-competitive means that were going on by the UFC, which su suppressed the mobility of fighters and fighter pay, uh, whether it be, was through uh, through acquiring other uh, organizations or um, utilizing different means to impact fighters, it was still occurring that that the UFC was utilizing uh, means beyond just market power to come to the, the stronghold it has become. So as far as Judge Bulwer goes, definitely he he's, he expressed concerns because it's his part his his part as the officer of the court to ensure that the individuals that have not yet shown up that are a part of the class of of Lee and potentially Johnson know of their uh, rights. And the concern with the Johnson case is that. Uh, he, he was uh, uh, uncertain about these contractual provisions that fighters had to sign. Also, the fact that the amount, uh, the minimal amount uh, in Johnson was quite low. Uh, I believe it was 3000 at a minimum that um, a fighter might have. Obviously, if you just fight once during that time frame, you probably have minimal amount to recover. But of course, if you fight more, then you might get more. Uh, and so that's that was Judge Ware, Judge Bulware's concern. He's an officer of the court. He granted the, he granted the cert the class certification in Lee, and and since he did so, he has to protect the rights of those those individuals. And so I can't blame Judge Bulware to be honest with you. It is the plaintiffs who brought forth their. Evidentiary evidence at the evidentiary hearing uh, several years ago to show the impact that the UFC's actions had on it, and they came up with uh, the damages in, in in the billions. And whether or not Judge Bulware fully uh, fully believed that, 
they have to go with that. And so, uh, so it's not really uh, Judge Bulwer's uh, fault for the settlement falling apart, simply because it's, uh, he is only getting what's put forth in front of him. And we might as well address this. I don't think it's a personal thing between Dana White, Lorenzo Fertitta, and Judge Bulwer. I, I do not recall the fact that they went to high school. It was never brought up. I don't think Judge Bulwer brought it up. He, the fact that Dana White does not want to be in this, uh, to comment on this lawsuit is fine. However, to just throw out a theory that the guy hates you because he, they went to high school together, makes obviously no sense and it's just an inference to influence people uh, in the PR world of, of this, law, of this uh, lawsuit, meaning that the UFC tried to settle but the judge hates Dana White. That's what, people, that's what Dana wants people to think. To make him look like the good guy in this, the or not the good guy, or just the innocent bystander in this, and th that's not the case. And it's irresponsible to just go ahead and state these things without any evidence. You could definitely bring up the fact that they they went to high school, but there, if barring any wanting to share any <laughs> any uh, incidents, I I it's it's a non sequitur. It means nothing uh, that they went to high school together. Uh, the fact of the matter is, it's not even brought up a lot. I, I mean, I didn't, I don't recall it ever happening. I, I John Nash had told me it, um, it, 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 it had happened, but I just don't recall it. The fact that Dana White brings it up is is a little weird, to be honest with you. So, uh, not Judge Bulwer's fault. Could it be the plaintiff's attorney's fault? Well, definitely, you could make the argument that the plaintiff's attorneys made too good of a presentation at the evidentiary hearing to the uh, to the point that they overshot the bar meaning that while they did prove that there was anti-competitive means not prove they uh, while they showed that there is potential for anti-competitive means on the part of Zufa and therefore the class of individuals of classifiers should be uh, should be certified the amount that they are damaged seemed to be astronomical in the billions uh, and you could say that Judge Bulwer believed the plaintiff's case and believe that there is potential for damages out here. So to go from billions of dollars down to $335 million for both cases seems uh, like, the, like Zufa is getting away with the steal because the amount of damages that could be proven at trial are much greater than what Zufa and the plaintiffs agreed to. Now you could say obviously there's risk involved in trial, but again, the judge has a duty here uh, since he certified the class that they must ensure the fact that the plaintiffs that are, have yet to appear that will get the notice in the mail or what or uh, or apply online or whatever to be a part of the class and get and get some sort of uh, recoupment uh, should be compensated fairly and if they were to come back and hear that they could have gotten three times the amount of whatever uh, whatever a fighter might get let's say that a fighter mid-level fighter it wasn't big big star gets twenty thousand dollars out of this this settlement could make much more could have helped him much more if they held on and he got three or four times the twenty thousand so eighty thousand dollars instead of the twenty thousand dollars definitely with 300 with 335 million dollars you are talking about life altering money but it, it, we're talking about the value of the particular case that the plaintiffs are are setting forth and and uh, telling the court did Judge Bulwer put the put plaintiffs in a bad position? Probably, but you'd have to realistically evaluate your case. And with that, I go to the the big culprit in this particular 
in this particular selling of the settlement, and that is the mediator. Now, the mediator in this case is the Honorable Lane R. Phillips. I believe that's his name. Uh, he is a former, former litigator out of California, uh, originally from uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma. But here is the fallacy with mediation. And you'll hear this from litigators that you may run into that have to go to mediation. And the fallacy is that the mediator will tell you about your case. I have ran into many, many attorneys who hate mediation because as everyone says, they know about their case. They don't need to be explained about the pitfalls of the case, the, the damages in the case, the things to prove in the case. It's absolutely, positively stupid. Mediation is nothing but a scam, if you ask me. And, he, and now, here is a great example of why mediation does not work. You had thought that $335 million was going to complete this case, that the case would be settled. The case is, two cases, 335. And you ha they had agreed to a five-year uh, five period in which the contracts would be relaxed as far as the sunset provisions, the the champions clauses, the right to match, the exclusivity, things of that nature. However, it left Zufa out. Zufa could come back uh, and did not have to uh, abide by those that five year period. And even in that case, they had already signed these, these uh, contracts in the Johnson case about no more arbitration and no more class action. What, what? <laughs> What? What's, what's, what's to become of that? And the 335, you know, if you looked at, at Dr. Singer's report, you know they, that it was going to come in at a higher number than 335, right? If you're the mediator and you can't get Zufa to come up in the money, then that's, that's fine. Go to trial. Why did they settle? Why did they settle? If you knew the case, if you're a famed guy that mediates cases, and not, and it's not just this gentleman right here. I'm sure he's a great attorney, great, great uh, litigator, but I'm just saying that mediation does not work all the time. I get you. I get there's a reason to have settlement conferences is to hear it out. Perhaps try to get the parties down because you, I mean, as attorneys, you have to be as zealous as you can to represent your 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 parties. So, you even though you see issues in your case, you're not going to to share that with the other party or the mediator. Everybody knows what the pitfalls are. So, with the three thirty five, you have to also be thinking. Would Judge Bulwer agree to it? If you're an experienced mediator, you should have known that Judge Bulwer was not going to agree to it. He already knew, he already expressed concerns with the Johnson party. So why not think about trying to split it up as far as Lee and Lee and Johnson? I know that I know Zufa wasn't didn't want to go for it, but at least you could have told them, foretold them, foreshadowed what was going to happen which was he was going to deny this case and everybody's going to trial even though they don't want to. So that's the problem. That's who sold it. That's my opinion. I know I, I probably am wrong here, but uh, definitely if you look at the things, if you just look at the fact that even though the Lee, par Lee party would be receiving a 90%, maybe 85, 90% of the $335 million, that there were still issues with Johnson. How are they going to impact that? And why is five, what would five years have done? If you're trying to make change within the industry, knowing that there would be no more class actions, 
this was your only chance. So if you were, if you were going to do the injunctive relief, if you're going to try to make some more, some change rather than just grab money, and grabbing money seems a little a little too pejorative, but maybe if you if you were there more for trying to help the fighters in the long run, you'd have to you'd have to hold out. It's it's really hard, right? It's ten years. Ten years is hard. Ten years is hard to de- to to wait for something to happen, I, and I get that from an attorney's business perspective and from a, a client's perspective. They, they're tired. There's old, they, these guys are getting old in age and do need the money. But now we're, we're, we're set with going to trial unless Zufa is willing to step up with bringing in more money. Now, maybe they do. Maybe they, maybe they, they like I said earlier, they, they, they try to chop it up and, and settle Lee out and then just hold on and see how the the discovery goes in in Johnson because Johnson they still have a motion to dismiss they still have a lot of lot of um, lot of weapons in in their arsenal to dismiss this case a motion for summary judgment they they could do uh, lots of other things to try to prolong this case even further the Johnson case that is so that's where we're at. I felt like I needed to get this out there to, to assess who, who is to be sold. Who, who sold this thing? Who sold the settlement? Why did this go away when both parties wanted it? This is Jason Cruz with MMA Payout, Legal Submission. Have a good one.